Everyone, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate uh, that you're taking the time away from your busy day. Um, and as Christina said, normally we would be doing this live and we would be with you and we'd enjoy the smell of wood chips and, and the sounds of equipment. We're gonna do a little different today, but it's still gonna be just as good. I put together a lot of information and, uh, and let's get right to it. So we move forward. So again, as she said, I'm coming to you from the West Coast, and I know my friends in Michigan are experiencing a lot of rain right now, so I wanted to put a little color on the screen and just say good morning, share some sunshine with you, and, uh, and let you know that, uh, of course, we're nationwide. We have people uh, joining us today from uh, perhaps Mexico and Canada, welcome, and again, different time zones. So I appreciate you all coming together this morning and, uh, and joining us as we're talking about optimizing chop saws. So let's get right to it. So there's no surprise, I'm, I'm gonna put it right out there. I'm gonna be talking about Salvador optimizing chop saws today. But before we get into the, the details and all the fun stuff of what's going on with technology and the equipment, I just wanted to kind of pause and talk about the company, uh, which is an Italian company that's been in business for nearly 40 years now. So, and again, this is uh, during the introduction, it was stated that I've been in manufacturing my entire life. I've been in a lot of facilities. I've been in, in uh, a lot of different industries and had the opportunity to see what's going on as, as we build things. And uh, I also had the opportunity recently to visit the Salvador factory. So I'm here to tell you that I was thoroughly impressed with the organization, the, the staff and the people and the quality of the, the components that they use. And, the, the total rounded package, and we're proud to be partnered with Salvador and offer the optimizing chop saws as a solution and work with you to help you do business as well. So a great company, uh, fantastic equipment, and I just wanted to put it out there that, yep, I'm talking about Salvador today. But before we get there, I also want to kind of set the stage a little bit here. So with this presentation, I talked about uh, you know, in the title, the value, right? Value of optimization. And, and I don't want to get hung up on the technology and how fast and, and how furious and how powerful and all these things, the technology component of it. But I want to step back as a business owner and as an operator and say, you know, what is the value of this piece of equipment to me? And if you are familiar with lean principles and 5S and the, the map of manufacturing, the very first step is defining the value. So I'm going to try and do that today too and help you recognize the value of optimization. And I'm going to ask you to do the same in your business. So how do you determine value? Right? Look at your own business. Look at what you offer to your customers. And if I had the opportunity to interview your customer, I would ask them, you know, what is the value in ABC? you know, uh, manufacturing? What did they offer to you? Why do you keep coming back to this person? Is it the price, right? Do they have a great value in terms of the price points and they offer something uh, monetarily? Is it the quality of their product? Maybe they have a, a superior quality and we really don't care about price and, and delivery. I really, I'm in it for the quality. So the last would be delivery speed, the ability to commit to a, a project and deliver on time, right? That's a value. And so I'm asking you to, to pause and think about it. What would your customers think about you, right? What are they after? And how are, the, how are you recognized in terms of value? One of the things that you do, and I, I know you're fully aware of this, that affects your values and, and, and how you operate your business is your material selection. So to oversimplify things, I'll say that in manufacturing, we buy raw materials, we turn them into something of greater value and we sell it. We profit from that. So our business grows, our, our profit is there, and that's what manufacturing is. It parts are parts. We bring in material, we produce a finished product. So what type of material do you bring into your shop? Because we're in a woodworking environment, I have choices. And I can bring in select and better and premium materials, and I can pay a higher dollar to bring those raw materials in and make my product or I could bring in maybe a lesser grade material and call out the valuable materials in it or optimize my purchase and still produce a high quality part. And we're gonna talk about that too. 
So those are my two kind of set the stage things for our presentation today. I want to talk about value. I'm going to ask you after the presentation, sometime during the course of the week or the next time you're in your shop, look at your cross cut, your chop cut, uh, chop saw operation, and, and try and identify the value and look at that value stream. And let's pay attention to how you manufacture things. So I'm going to go back to my, my opening slide, which wasn't a coincidence. Um, I'm here in the West Coast and down the street we have a little grower, uh, a, a produce boutique type shop and they're selling these little orange crates. They're decorative, you know, they're not a, a shipping crate, but they're a novelty gift item. And the owner has come to us today and I say us because you and I for this morning are in business together. So again, we have the tools, we have the capability, we make things and we make things from wood luckily. So here's an opportunity for us as this customer has approached us and said, hey, can you guys make these for us? I need to place an order. So I'm calling them decorative boxes. A, a crate would be unfair because they're meant to be repurposed and they're meant to be a, a gift item. And so we're gonna take a look at it and now I've got you thinking, right? Can you make these? If I need a couple end caps and some slats and we put these together, I think it's within our wheelhouse, but even before we had a chance to discuss it, our operations person nodded her head yes, and she said, we're building these. So we took this order. Okay, so this is our story problem for today. The order's for 925 crates. And again, I'm gonna call them decorative boxes. We are about to make some money, and I think if we do this right, and we have the right process, uh, we can deliver on time, and this is gonna be a good project for us. So, what do we need from the customer? Well, obviously I need some dimensions here. So what size is this thing? What is the material? They're asking for a clear hardwood. So they don't want a rustic look. This is a, a little bit, like I said, it's a decorative item. And then we have a delivery date. And I'm not gonna tell you a delivery date because it's pretty aggressive. So we just need to start thinking about how we're gonna do this and we're gonna make this product. So as a manufacturer, what are we looking for? We're looking now at the process specifications, right? As you see the product before you, what machining stations in your shop are we gonna use, right? How are we gonna process this? Now, each of us are gonna be a little different. We have all, all shapes and sizes of businesses with us today, and I'm sure that you have different capabilities. So there again, the flexibility of manufacturing is among us. And I'm gonna ask you in your mind or on a piece of paper, how are we, how are we gonna process this? Ultimately, we're gonna to get to the point where somebody needs a cut list. I have to know what is the dimension of this material and what are the specific cuts and how is that gonna happen on the floor? So, and then for the sake of our presentation today, obviously we need to put them together and, and get them out of here, but we're not gonna do that. Our, our presentation today is about optimizing cross-cut saws. So I'm gonna stop right there at that cut list. and We're gonna focus on one thing today and that is we're gonna cut the parts out for our product and we need to make it happen. So if you guys are ready to go to work, the first thing I would do, let's go out to our prototype shop and we just gotta cut one out, right? Let's figure this thing out. We know the dimensions, those slats are 14 inches long and we've got two end pieces. And when we put that together, it makes our little decorative box. So here's our little crate. And I'm just gonna throw some numbers up on the screen for you to kind of help us move along. But we know for each product, right, for each of these decorative boxes, I need nine slats and I need two end caps. And again, we're gonna forgo the assembly and the other parts uh, for our presentation today, but this is our task. So again, I'm asking you, with the equipment that you have in your shop and the availability, can we process this job? It doesn't sound bad. And honestly, when I found out what we're, you know, what we're being paid for our little decorative boxes, it looked like a pretty uh, lucrative opportunity. And then this hit me. Remember, they want 925 of them. So the reality of it is when you start putting the numbers on paper and you consider our process, this is 10,000 parts, right? And these are pieces parts I'm talking. I'm not into lineal feet yet or board feet. We're just talking handling parts. And in manufacturing, it's about individual pieces, making an assembly and shipping a product. So here we are with 10,000 pieces that we have to handle this morning in our presentation. And specifically, we're gonna cut these on a saw. So how are we gonna do that? Let's go back to that prototype for a second. 
Okay, and again, I think it's a good exercise, whether we're building a five-piece door or a cabinet or a decorative box, you have to go through the process once to fully understand it. I think having a prop is also helpful for the staff and for the people that are gonna be tasked with helping us do this project and helping us build it. So if they have a vision and they know what our end product is and they understand the quality, it's easier for us to project that. So we went out to our little prototype shop and we cut one out. Now, right away, you're, notice, you're on me because you notice I'm using a DeWalt chop saw and you're saying, well, that's, that's not gonna optimize anything and you're exactly right. But time and time again, we, as we work with our customers and, and we visit you know, full-fledged, very profitable uh, businesses, I see manual operations and we see skilled people, right? Using equipment that's available to them to produce those products. And if this is you, that's great. You, you have, like I said, a skilled workforce. We have a workstation. You have tools that, are, that you know you trust and you get the job done. And this is where I'm asking you to step back for a second and, and take a, a look at the amount of time and the process and the amount of handling and the people involved, right? And, and the skilled trades and the skilled labor that we have producing our products, they're, they're paying attention to detail. They're, they have their fingers in this machine and they're, they're all around it. And uh, I, wanted to, I wanna kind of evaluate that. So manual chop saw is a great solution. And again, I know you have these and um, there's, there's a place and a project for those. So is, it, is this gonna be our solution for our decorative boxes today? And I hope you're shaking your head no, and we're gonna say no, I don't think so. Remember we have 10,000 parts and a very aggressive delivery date. So in our story problem, we're gonna up the, you know, up the ante a little bit. Let's move to a different workstation. So in this case, we're looking at an ironwood and this is an upcut saw, it's a great machine. And again, our operator is gonna to have to do a little bit of setup. And I'm, I'm running through this at a fast pace so that we don't have to uh, watch every single step, but we're gonna process two, two of our, our decorative boxes this time. So with this machine, we're able to produce a high quality part. We got a great cut, we've got a precision length. We're using a little bit of CNC now. You see that we have a, a, a controlled defense there with a the tiger stop. So there's some benefits with this setup and this is gonna help us improve our accuracy, it's safer, right? Our fingers aren't in the saw and I'm not around it. So there are definitely some advantages here, but when we start doing this time study and we start looking at the amount of handling in the process, and then you, rec you know, again, remember we have 10,000 parts, um, it looks like we're gonna be here a while. So even though we were able to produce two of those, I don't think that's gonna be our choice, okay? And in all fairness, um, yes, we can optimize and improve that setup a little bit for the upcut. We could optimize and set up our manual chop saw too. And there's people out there that can really make them sing. But this is why we're here today. So again, we're gonna turn this up one notch and we're gonna walk over to an optimizing chop saw. Here's what we're, we're here, this is what we're here for today, right? This is the machine. So it's a Salvador machine. It's dressed in styles colors, right? So why is this different? You know, we went from a full manual saw to something that has a little bit of automation, some CNC and controlled, controlled uh, lengths on a fence. But here's the difference, right? If I back up, first of all, this is computerized, right? So we have intelligence added to this machine and it's gonna do a number of different things for us. And we're gonna go into that here in just a second. But that's the first uh, major difference that yes, it's an upcut saw, it's completely enclosed in that cabinet, so it's safe, but it also has a lot of uh, software behind it. Also, it's mechanized, and by that I mean it's power fed. We're gonna have an in-feed system and an out-feed system. The benefits of having the in-feed and the out-feed, of course, is consistency, and it's gonna kind of drive the, the production flow or the cadence, if you will. So if, uh, I'm on my upcut saw, I'm on my ironwood or my manual saw and I'm having a great day and I'm feeling spunky, I'm gonna produce a little bit more, but if I'm kind of dragging my feet, I don't feel like I need to work as hard, I might not get those same numbers. With a machine like this, uh, we're gonna set the feed rate and we're gonna set the program and we're gonna have our cut list all loaded. So our operator becomes more of an operator, if you will, right? 
kind of an inspector and, and someone that's going to feed this machine, not so much a skilled craftsman or someone that is uh, a build and assembly expert. So there's the two major differences, heavily computerized, and we've got some automation going on. So we do like that. Okay, so what does that look like? In a short video, this is a through feed machine, so it's belt fed. And again, I'm taking just kind of a casual approach. I'm gonna feed our slats in and the machine's gonna take them. The cut list is already established, kind of like it was on our Tiger Stop. And here's a quick glance at what it would look like inside. Now, I couldn't film both of those at the same time, but that's absolutely what's going on. So a belt fed machine, an upcut blade, the optimization is in place, so it's gonna be paying attention to waste. And you saw a little air jet take that waste piece off and get it out of our way. And our parts flow is super smooth. So in on one side, out on the other. Let's take a look now, right? Let's look at the comparisons of the three things that we just walked through very quickly and get an idea of what's going on here. That manual miter saw, if we did the time study, we'd find it took us about 90 seconds. So yes, we, again, we can improve that time, but let's just use the 90 seconds as our example uh, right from the video. So if we need to process 10,000 parts, it's gonna take us 23 hours. That's just to get these slats cut, okay? 23 hours to run that. If we went back to the ironwood, again, a great solution. We've got an upcut saw and we can improve this as well. But again, to compare oranges to oranges, it's 45 seconds per product. And this is, again, gonna take us 11 and a half hours. So our process time here is still more than a shift. This is more than a day of just cutting the pieces we need before we even get to assembly. And to keep it on an even playing field, we didn't flex any muscles with the, with the saw. We didn't turn on any of the capabilities or anything that gives it this tremendous advantage. We merely used the in-feed system, the same cut list, and an out-feed, and you could see a dramatic improvement in time. So now I'm starting to feel better about our project, right? We took this on. I think we're going to make our delivery date if we go this route. So it takes about 22 seconds to process those slats, and if we look at that uh, the, the piece count that we needed, um, you know, we're in like 8,000 pieces, something like that, 22 seconds, we're in the five, six hour range. So dramatic improvement. So there's our story problem. I really just wanted to give you an opportunity to think about the equipment that you have and, and ask the question, ask me that question. What's the value in an optimizing you know, crosscut saw, why would I want this? How can it help my business? So let's step away from our story problem just for a second. I wanna go back to this family of saws. And again, I'm gonna paint a broad picture here and then we're gonna eliminate a couple of these from our discussion. But at the bottom of the screen is a super angle, right? So this is a Salvador super angle and the name implies uh, the function. And yes, we can miter with this. Okay, so at a 90 degree perpendicular cut across a lineal stick, we can move plus or minus 70 degrees, okay? It's gonna be fed with a pusher, and I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, an infeed table of lengths up to say 20 feet, okay? So a very specific application with miter capability and an awesome solution, but probably not for us in, in the nature of our business. The super cut, right? This is a through feed machine and it's belt fed. So we're gonna have an operator, right? Our inspector operator is gonna stand at the in-feed side. We're gonna feed the machine and the parts are gonna come out on the other side. This is what we're using for our solution today. And that's what you saw in that short video was a super cut through feed saw. And again, I'm gonna get into the details and I'm gonna talk about this uh, it, and give you a little bit more information. But before we go there, let's look at this super push, okay? Again. The name implies the function, right? Easy to remember. This is a pusher. And, and how are those different? I think that's important for you to know because if we're being serious about this and we're looking at optimizing chop saws as a potential solution for us in the future and, and up in our business, um, we're gonna have to have that discussion about the types of products we make, the types of applications and the, and the things that we need this saw to do. And so our product specialists would help us kind of sort through that uh, you know, that discussion and then make that recommendation. So let's look at that super push, just so you know what that is. 
And in this video, you're gonna see that the table's different. It's not belt fed. It, it, it's, again, as the name implies, it's pushing material. So it's a 30 degree inclined surface. And when we drop our component in there, our, our, our material that we're gonna cut to length, the machine's gonna feed it in with a pusher. It's that simple, okay? So what's different here is that it has a protective hood, but that's also a pressure beam. So we're holding down, it's gonna provide a little bit of backing for us too. So when we start talking about precision component parts and super crispy cuts, I start to lean toward a pusher because we have the ability to make some incredible cuts here uh, in terms of quality and accuracy. Okay, so there's this pusher, it's feeding our, our material through. And again, we're just talking about the input and the output at this point. As it comes back to grab the next part, there's a scanner that's located in that same mechanism. And it's, you could see it in the video, but what it's doing is it's measuring the board, right? So here's the real benefit in a pusher. Can we, can we cut multiple sticks at one time? And the answer is yes, of course. So now as I start thinking about our little decorative box, our orange crates, I'm thinking, you know what? This pusher's looking really uh, attractive to me because we have nine slats per box. And could I, could I stack these three by three or four by three? Could we cut nine or 12 at a time? And the answer is yes. If we fit within the envelope, we could stack our material and now we're really cutting down our process time per unit. So stack cutting is an option in a pusher. Okay, there's, the saw comes with different size feet on that pusher. So as you see right now, we're pushing one stack of four. And if we wanted to get into a wider pack, um, we would change the foot and allow it to push more material at one time. Okay, so here you have a narrow foot and it's gonna select one board at a time. So why would I do that? Why, if I have all this capability of stacking, why would I wanna push one board at a time? And the answer is defecting, right? And we haven't talked about this yet, but as an inspector, as, a, as a, an operator, I can highlight the defects on each board and feed them one at a time. And again, as the machine retracts and it comes back to push the next one, it's scanning and looking for my crayon mark. So again, we'll talk about this here in just a second, but there's definitely an operation and an application where we would feed them one at a time. The other thing I wanna point out right here is that where's the operator, right? We don't have a person standing here. If we get ahead of ourselves and we've got enough material going into the saw, that gives us the opportunity to move downstream and collect our, our cut pieces. So we can have them going into a bin, onto a cart, they might be pushed out onto a table. There's a number of different ways to handle the material coming out. But again, unlike our manual chop saw and our manual upcut saw, we don't have to have somebody standing there driving the cadence, driving the production. The machine's gonna set that pace for us, okay? So there's a little bit about super push. And I just wanted to throw the pusher information in there because again, it's a conversation. I think it's a valuable conversation and it's a technology that you might wanna be familiar with. So let's go back to our super cut. We're back to our story problem. and We're using a through feed saw. And there's a couple options here too. For the person that's uh, maybe compact and we don't have enough floor space or these are great machines. I would never have the amount of space required to put one of these in place. And I have an answer for you, right? So with this through feed solution, the one above on the, the compact is what we were running for our little uh, decorative box project. And it has a one meter outfeed belt. And we're gonna leave that up to you. You could build a table. Um, we could put a bin. We can, we can handle our material however we choose, but also, uh, know that a through feed saw has an outfeed option as well. So kickers and sorting and some things downstream we're gonna talk about here in just a second. But again, I'm gonna kind of zoom right in on this one machine because this is the one that I was using today is a compact version. And I wanna just throw some numbers at you in terms of footprint. And this is roughly 16 feet by four feet. So uh, is that all the space I need? And the answer is no, because we're gonna have a lot of material moving through here. So I would recommend if you were chalking this out on the floor or putting some tape down to figure out if it fits into your business model, uh, we need to think about material handling as well. 
So you want to take that into account. And remember that this is going to move parts and pieces um, at an exponential rate. So you're going to have to keep that flow moving and we're going to want to uh, accommodate for that. So we just kind of ran through the family really quick. And I want to throw some terminology out there because again, if we're going to have this conversation um, and you're, you're serious about optimizing technology, these are some of the things that you're going to have to know. Pack cutting, for instance. Okay, you saw that in the video with the pusher. And we were able to put multiple components, right, multiple boards, and push them in at once and cut them as a pack. So pack cutting is, is maybe something you want to do, maybe not. Single board cutting. Well, let me back up. Pack cutting. Can I pack cut on a through feed machine is a question we're often asked. And the answer is no, right? A through feed machine is is a fast moving machine, but it's meant to take one board at a time. And you'll see why here in a second. So pack cutting is reserved for the pusher people, okay? Second on our terminology list is single board cutting. Why would I want to single board cut when we're talking about volume and we're talking about efficiency and I need to push material through? And the answer is very simple. In a single board cutting solution, this, gonna, this is gonna give us the opportunity to defect. So as an inspector operator, I can look for knots and, and defects and I can mark them with the crayon and remove them from our process. It also gives me the opportunity to buy lesser grade material at a great price and call out the premium components that meet our cut list. So single board cutting is something that you'll definitely wanna do. And this is one of the main advantages of an optimizing saw. So can I single board cut on a through feed? Absolutely, that's required. Can I single board cut on a pusher? And the answer again is absolutely, you can do that. Defecting is the last one on this page. And what do we wanna do? You know, why are we removing unwanted material? Well, in this product example today for our decorative boxes, the customer doesn't want any knots. They're not looking for a rustic look. They want a clean, clear look of a quality material. And so we're gonna remove those knots and we're gonna do that with our saw we're able to buy one common material and still meet the customer's needs. So this is really important. Also with defecting, we have the ability to identify some lower grade materials, maybe still usable. Let's say they're staining or unusual grain or something doesn't quite look right. Um, we can put a mark on the board and I'll talk about this in a second as well. We can identify for the saw that this is the lower grade material and let it sort that out for us as well. Optimizing, and this is my last page of terminology, but optimizing is that big word that was in our presentation title, right? And what does this really mean to us? We've, we've talked about cutting uh, these components to length, right? We need these 14 inch slats, but what if we were able to buy random length material? Or what if maybe our pack of material came in and it was all one constant length? How do we optimize? We, today we leave this up to our operator, right? This is our skilled tradesperson that has to make decisions and they know that uh, we have a given length off our cut list and they're trying to get the most out of a board. But typically what we see if someone's running a manual chop saw is a yield of about 60 to 65%, right? Again, it's about attitude and ownership and, and pride in what I'm doing when I produce my parts. And then quite frankly, I'm trying to be efficient and move along because I have a due date. So I'm hustling. And even if I put a tiger stop on and I'm using that, you know, that upcut saw and we've got this great ironwood solution, we typically see 65, 70% yield. So we improve our yield, but again, we're not taking the time because we don't have the time to look at every single board measurement, compare it to a cut list, find an optimal solution, and then get the most out of it. So optimizing is what the game is all about. This is why we're here. We wanna get the most out of every board and improve our yield. We can also value optimize. So we can length optimize and value optimize. We can kind of sort out some of those grain and stains and still use those on a lower grade product. Last is board sensing. And we have to throw this in here. I thought it was important because we're gonna put crayon marks on our defects and on our boards to help the machine do its job. And it's important for you to know that we're sensing those crayon marks we're not scanning, right? We're not looking or scanning the board and grading it with a computer. This is still requiring uh, our operator. So let's go back to 
our Supercut 100. This is our little through feed machine. It is such an amazing piece of equipment. I absolutely love running this. And we're gonna, we're gonna start on the in feed end. Double marking platform, you'll hear us say. And what does that mean? Essentially, um, we're gonna be defecting, right? One of the advantages of this through feed technology and having this table here is that we can put the crayon marks on, we're buying number one common, or again, we're buying the lesser material, and we're gonna, we're gonna defect. So for me to stand here and try and feed the beast, right? I can't keep up, it's going so fast. So if I have, again, the right opportunity, with the right product mix and the right solution, we would have a person standing on each side. And you'll see in the floor plan that we can uh, accommodate an operator on each side. So they're gonna take turns feeding boards in and trying to keep up. Well, let's take a little uh, quick look at what's going on here. So I don't have the machine running, we're keeping the noise down, but this is what it looks like. I'm gonna drop that material. These are our slats, right? These are three eighths thick. And then I encountered one that has a defect. And again, our product doesn't call for knots. We can't have anything like this. So we're gonna mark it with a crayon. So there's a clear piece that goes into the machine. And we're gonna say to our Salvador optimizing chop saw, take this out for me, okay? Now you'll notice there's no regard to where in the board along the linear distance this is. The machine has a cut list and it knows what its job is and it's also keeping track of the quantities. And as this board is coming into the machine, it's gonna pick up on the beginning of the board so it knows the starting uh, end of the board where the length is. It's gonna identify those fluorescent marks if they exist and it's gonna come up with a solution in less than a second, okay? And this is gonna beat my operator every single day, all week long. I know that the machine is gonna think faster, it's gonna be consistent, and I don't have to worry about that yield and trying to get the most out of the material. All my job is to identify uh, the defects. So that's what's going on as it comes in, and it also it's gonna identify the end of the board, and then it's gonna provide that solution for us. So inside the machine, right, this is again a primary and, and very fundamental difference between a pusher and a through feed. Our through feed material uh, is conveyed on a belt. It's gonna move along on the in feed belt. It has a series of pressure rollers. So we're applying a, a light pressure, we're holding on to it so that it's registered against the belt, we can control the length. But that sensor was hidden between those wheels at the early onset of this board as it comes into the machine. And in the left illustration, that left photograph rather, you'll see that the blade is up, right? So this is an upcut motion. And this is something else I wanna point out, the difference between a super cut and a super push is that with this cut, we don't have the pressure beam, okay? So faster movement, less moving parts, a faster action. We're able to cut through this. And if I showed you the pictures and we have some close-ups of our, our oak slats for our, our little decorative boxes, you'll be impressed at the quality of the cut, right? That we're able to accomplish even without a backing plate or a pressure beam behind it. But it's something that we have to keep in mind. So on a through feed saw built for speed and built for certain product mixes, we're not gonna have uh, that hood and that pressure beam. So super cool. Okay, now let's talk about the controls. And we really haven't even gotten into this and I would love nothing more than to launch this software right now and do a demo for you and get into it. But we're gonna reserve that for another day. And we hope that if, and, you, know, if you continue our conversation and as you're pursuing more information about optimizing crosscut saws, this is something you'll definitely wanna look at. But what's going on in the controls, okay? It's computer driven. So we know that we're gonna to have to have a cut list. And where does that cut list come from? Well, if we're just getting started and we don't have um, you know, uh, cut right and some of the other great software packages that are out there feeding our, our organization, you could stand at the machine and enter your cut list in right here. So let's just say we're, this is our first venture into the technology world of, of manufacturing and our first you know, automated piece of equipment we may have to just enter our cut list in here and it's super easy to do. We're gonna put in our cut list, we're gonna put in our quantities, we're gonna talk about um, the uh, optimization, how we wanna apply our optimization rules, we're gonna have priorities against 
uh, different lengths. We're going to have value in certain types of materials. And all of this is done super easy right from the control. If you're somewhere in between having software in your office and driving your product mix with, with you know, um, some of the CAD software and, and manufacturing software that's out there, the soft, this tool also, the saw, comes with an Excel spreadsheet. So you have an Excel template that you could build your cut list uh, outside of production as well. So there's a nice step into, again, a, the software world that's gonna help you be more efficient. But a lot going on in the controls, and uh, this again is one of the main powerhouses, the intelligence behind optimization. So it's worth looking at. Continuous inkjet printing, right, after the cut. So in that control, if we were to step back into the software, I said I have slats and they're 14 inches long and I need uh, eight, more than 8,000 of them. We could choose to have them printed and we can tell in the program and in that control what we would like the printer to do for us. And today I, I have a picture of a Zanazi continuous inkjet printer. This would be one of our partners that would have the table set up at our manufacturing seminar. And, uh, and I'm sorry they're not here with us today, but a great shout out for our friends at Zanazi. So a great printer, super fast. It has barcode capability. And again, so thinking about your process and your flow, uh, we have a customer that's using a Salvador and they print the length of the part on the part which initially when I saw that, I thought, I know what the length is. Why would you print the length on there? That's kind of silly, but it's not because they had so many parts that were in close proximity. They were nine inch, nine and a quarter, eight and three quarters. Now in their operation, their, their operators used to have to put a tape on it as they're sorting things out or as they're pulling a bin and just to validate the length of the part. But now everyone has the part length printed right on it, which is super cool. It's very intuitive and um, a lot of options with printing. So I wanted to throw that in there. Last but not least, high-speed ejectors. So what's going on on the exit side of this machine, right? We have multiple table lengths available to you. And I showed you our little Optimus uh, or our, our through feed machine. This is a Supercut 100. And I had a one meter out feed belt on that machine with no kickers. So what you didn't see in the photo is that we have a sorting table and our parts are just pushed out onto a table. And I'm gonna to have to collect those and sort them out and carry them over to our assembly area. But in, as we grow and as you wanna look at that flow and continuous movement again and take care of your materials, there are options here. And these, you know, these tables um, come in various lengths and numbers of kickers and uh, a lot of programmability here as well. So before I walked away from it, I wanna just throw this quick video in there and show you that this is programmable. So our waste, our offcut could go all the way out and drop into a box. We can kick it out at the blade with air. Uh, there's some other options as well. And here um, you're seeing, they, they look a, a little bit aggressive and they are, they're meant to move fast to keep our material out of the way. But we also have pads that we can put on these. So if your material is delicate or we have a little bit softer material and the finish is super important to us, um, that can be protected as well. So there's kind of the roundup for optimizing chop saws, crosscut saws. And I wanna come back to my title again and talk about value. And in, in this presentation today, we've spent just over 30 minutes talking about, you know, the, the meaning behind uh, optimization as a word. We've seen the technology just briefly uh, from a distance. And I, I can't stress enough the safety elements here. Uh, fully enclosed light curtains on the pusher, so you're not gonna have your hands down in there. Fully enclosed saw operation in a box with industry standard lockouts. Um, we just don't have the safety issues that we do with some of the manual equipment. So that one's big to me, always the number one priority for us, even though it may not uh, be high on our customers list, it's high on my list. Speed, right? The speed of the machines are incredible. As we're talking about through feed again, that belt uh, taking the material through at 400 to 600 feet per minute, right? If you think about that, that's an incredible number to think about processing linear cuts. However, um, we don't just calculate our feed and, and then try and put a time on the job because it depends on the number of cuts, right? So it's like driving your Ferrari in the city. If you're gonna cut a lot of little parts, you're gonna never really get up to full speed. So you're gonna be making a lot of cuts, but it's still moving material 
through at a much, much faster speed, much faster rate. Yield, this one I can't stress enough, right? This is what we're talking about. Again, on a manual saw with a 60 or 65% yield, our target's gonna be to get you up to 70, 80%. And we're able to do that with, you know, by letting the saw apply the measurements. It's gonna measure the board, it's gonna put a solution on in less than a second, it's gonna execute. And it's gonna do it consistently to the point where we're starting to, to uh, glean some value from that. So in our project, let's go back to our decorative boxes, right? We're, we're buying hardwood for that. And if we had to go out and buy select and better material and we were cutting it manually, you know, my prices that, that we checked this week, I'm somewhere between, uh, if we're doing these in maple, it was just over four bucks, you know, a board foot. And if we're following the oak path, it was say $3, 320 you know, for a board foot, a select and better. And if I stepped down one grade and I went down to one common and I was using the optimizing chop saw, I'm able to get number one common red oak for a buck 86. So look at the difference there. We're talking about an initial purchase of $3,200 in material for our boxes, but by grading down, right, taking one step down, we spent $1,800. That's over $1,000 in material cost difference for the same project. So yield is important to us and material is important to us. So we're able to bring the material conversation to the table uh, much more consistently. Some of my digital friends would be, uh, you know, would say I was remiss if I didn't bring up the data and that if you're not really technological and your shop is still heavily manually uh, operated, the data improvements are incredible. And again, how do, we, how do we validate this? I'm gonna ask you the simple question. And that is, what is your yield today? When you buy a bunker material and it's coming in for the build, what do you expect to get in yield? And a lot of the times it's, it's an educated guess. You know, we have to go out and look at the dumpster, right? To see what kind of material is leaving and make a, an approximation on what we think we're getting out of our purchase. But now it's real, it's data. And the saw is gonna collect the data from the day it was installed right? So we have a running like an odometer on your car. We have running data from linear feet to hours of operation, hours of movement, and it's all in the control. And we also have kind of like a trip odometer. You have an operation uh, or an operator that can clear some of the data and keep track of specific jobs. So those uh, levels of information, that, that kind of information coming out of the control is real. And it also helps us make intelligent decisions and business choices as we move forward. Last on my bullet list was handling. And again, the amount of material handling and the improvements that we can see with an optimizing crosscut saw like this with kickers is just tremendous, right? We're able to process material through a super even flow. We're minimizing the amount of touch, right? That's one of the things that we want to do the least of is handle this material and move it right to assembly. So there's my top six, right? And uh, not necessarily in that order, but I also wanna wrap up as we're coming to a close here, I wanna throw some names out there and I'm not putting contact information up there for you, but I just wanted you to know our Solidwood team across the United States is here for you. And again, I'm on the West Coast. So if you're in my neighborhood, I hope that you'll reach out to me and I can share more information and help you with your decisions on, on Crosscut but we also have people uh, all across the United States, and this is an amazing team. You can reach them through Styles, or you can, if you send me a note or even through my email, I can direct you to someone that may be in your time zone, perhaps, or someone that's a little bit closer to home. 